Have you ever felt like there was just so much going on? Especially in this season, like you watch the news because really like what else is there to do in this season of lockdown? You watch the news, you scroll through social media. Some of you, for the first time in your life, you're like going to your doctor and you're like, I have this pain in my wrist and my thumb. It's like, because all you do is this. And you ever realize like on your, on your news feed and on your social media feed, there's just so much pain and so much brokenness and so much need. Do you ever feel like it's just so overwhelming how broken the world is? And do you ever start to feel guilty, like, oh, I should probably do something about that, and I should probably do something about that, and oh, if I was a good person, and if I had my stuff together, or if I just had a little bit more money or a little bit more time, I would do something about that, right? And then if, if guilt isn't enough, like as Jesus followers, we add another layer to that. We have this proposition that we use all the time. It's not official. It's not in the Bible. But Jesus people do use it all the time when they're talking about their pet project. They're like, you have to care about fill in the blank because Jesus cares about it. Right, you have to care about this issue because it's an issue that Jesus spoke about. Then they point to a verse or they point to a story and they're like, see, Jesus cares about it. You should care about it. You should be doing more about it. You should be giving more to it. And you're just like, oh man, the cycle just keeps going over and over again. You feel guilty and then you feel more tired. So you haven't even done anything yet, but you're exhausted. And it's like, how do I ever do anything? I just can't handle it, right? And so you just start to like realize like the list going on and it's like, okay, like I didn't even have that category growing up, like racial injustice and prejudicial behavior in the world. That's a Jesus thing. Okay, I should probably learn more about that. And as you start to explore that, you're like, oh, and it's not just this country. It's not just south of the border. I need to, if, if I'm going to care about racial injustice, I have to think about the genocide that's happening right now and the ethnic cleansing in Ethiopia. I have to learn about that. I have to learn about the, the Muslim hate that's going on across the world and the violence that's happening in Europe right now. I have to worry about the caste systems. I have to worry about the tensions between the Israelis and the Palestinians and hundreds of other examples just of racial tension. Then you bring the poor into that because Jesus cared for the poor. And you start to think about like, man, that's a Jesus thing too. And you think about the homeless, those are that homes just in our city. That's overwhelming. And then you think about the working poor in our province who actually are just, just scraping by to make rent just to make ends meet. Then you start thinking about those who are working so hard to create the goods, to ship across the ocean, working in sweatshops to you know, perpetuate our utopian life over here. And you think about the 1.3 billion humans currently living in slums in the world. Those are all Jesus things. Then you think about lives that are endangered, whether lives in wombs that haven't been born yet, to kids being trafficked on the streets of Cambodia, to abused teenagers in our own city who are homeless because the only space that is safe is away from the home they grew up in. And now they're taking drugs to try and erase the memories of the horrible things that happened in those homes. You start to think about their lives that are endangered and you think those lives matter too. And it's like, and that's a Jesus thing too. And is your bandwidth crashing? Because mine's crashing at this point. It's like, how do, you, how do you keep track of all the needs? And as Jesus people, it's like, we're supposed to care about all those things. So how, how do you do it? It's on our news feed. It's on our social media feed. So what do we do with that? Do you see how quickly the proposition that you need to care about this because Jesus cares about this isn't gonna last long? It just makes life impossible to actually live if you're gonna live it authentically. In the last few years with the rise of social media, our awareness and our exposure to the brokenness in the world has just risen. It is higher, this is just statistically accurate, higher than any other time in history. You are more aware than any other humans in history how broken our world is. Forget about the fact that history actually shows us and stats show us we're actually getting a little bit better as a planet. Crime is actually going down, poverty slowly being eliminated, and yet you are more aware than any human has ever been of how broken and in need of help our world is. And our human spirits are crushing under the weight of it. And yet all these things are close to Jesus' heart. So what do we do with that? Because my experience, and it's kind of two extremes, and you may be like, no, it's a bit more nuanced. I kind of fall somewhere in the middle there, and that's fine, me too. But like, there's two kind of extreme reactions that I think that happens. Number one, you try and speak to every single issue, decry every tragedy and injustice the problem is you only have 24 hours a day, seven days in a week, and you probably should sleep like six to eight hours a night. And you start to realize that as you're trying to speak and decry everything and call out all the injustices, that as your voice gets louder, as your posts and reposts get more frequent, the actual time that you have left to actually spend on those issues, personally serving or giving financially to those causes that are breaking your heart have not grown in line 
with the amount of things you've spoken about or posted about or reposted about. You're so busy trying to stay on top of all the issues, you have no time to tackle any of them. The second extreme is that as we're bombarded by all the needs, trans youth suicide rates, racial injustice, deaths of indigenous children, genocide, famine, warlords, decline in evangelism across the world, clean water projects, mental health crisis, your bandwidth just crashes and you just tap out. You stop reading the news. You decide to get off social media for a little while or forever because you have no idea how to respond to all of it. And so you respond to none of it. Those are the extremes. And I realize we kind of fall in the middle, but isn't that kind of the gravitational pull to do one of those things? And yet, instead of trying to do all of it, and instead of running from it, Jesus shows us a way to navigate life in the midst of all the brokenness. And when you can heal the sick, cast out the demons, and raise the dead, let me tell you, you are aware of brokenness because everybody brings brokenness to your front door. So today, if you would, I would love for you to journey with us in the next part of our Unexpected Jesus series. Luke chapter four, verse 40 to 511 is where we're gonna be covering today. And I'm so excited because I promise you, there's something so helpful that I discovered years ago in this text that was so freeing for me. And I promise you, it's gonna be so freeing for you to discover this way of Jesus in the midst of never ending need. Luke 440, if you could turn there, I'd love that. At sunset, that's the end of the day, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. Anyone here ever have or presently worked retail? I have, okay. Oh, there's three of us. Okay, oh, no, okay, a few more now. Excellent, okay. This is the equivalent, let's just call this out, of the customer, you know this customer, I promise you, right? Or restaurant, you know, patron or whatever. This is the equivalent of the one that shows up five minutes before you close and walks right in and has a big list or is ready for a big dinner. And it's like, oh, you know that moment? It's just like, seriously, like, we just cleaned everything. We just cleaned all the grills. Like, we don't even have the red lobster buns ready for you anymore. Like, we have to make fresh ones. Seriously, at 9.55, you walk in. Like, this is how I would feel if I was Jesus. It's like sunset. It's like we're, you know, turning in for the night. And then people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. And it's just like, seriously, it's been a long day. Personally, I'd be frustrated, but Jesus is a little bit better than me as a human. This is what he does. And laying hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you're the son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. Remember last week, Robin taught us, this, is, this was the idea back then. It was if the demons knew your name, they had authority over you, and he just tells them to shut up. He's laying hands on people, he's healing them, and he's casting out demons, people who are demonized. I love this. Like I just pause and already I'm amazed at the person of Jesus because we know he has the power to heal and he doesn't even need to be present to do it. There's a story later on where someone comes like, my daughter's sick. It's like, she's healed. It's like, but I haven't even brought her here. It's like, she's healed, right? Jesus could literally in this moment, the crowd shows up and it's like, it's, it's the end of my shift here. And he just kind of, he could, we know he has the power. He could just be like, God bless this mess. You're all healed. Go, go to bed, right? I'm going to bed too. He could do that. But because he loves people, he takes time to lay hands on every single one of them, look them in the eye, maybe talk with them, pray with them, and heal them. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Now, all the extroverted, go with the flow kind of people who are always late because they ran into someone and I was just, oh, I was just catching up with them. I just love, you love this kind of verse because you're like circle, highlight, underline, like Jesus just goes with the flow. People show up, it wasn't planned. He was supposed to be somewhere else, but he's just gonna heal them. And you use that as your excuse for why you are the way you are. And that's not gonna last long, so... Don't hold your breath, because then it shifts. At daybreak, the next morning, Jesus went out to a solitary place, okay? He's like, I just need some quiet. Jesus often did this, just needed to get away. The people were looking for him. It's like, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. It's like, no, 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 don't go. We want to keep you. I want to keep you, right? Which is, which is awesome. And then this is what happened. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Remember the kingdom of God? Wholeness for individuals and communities. Robin talked about it last week. Good news for the kingdom of God to the other towns also. It's like, you're not the only city in this region. I gotta go to the other place because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Uh-oh, Jesus read the boundaries book. And Jesus is like, I, I see that you guys found me, but I actually have plans today. Sorry, peace, and just walks away. 
and goes to preach in the other village. And now all the like calculated people, all the scheduled people, you're circling, underlining, and you're like, see, Jesus makes a plan and he sticks to the plan. He's not spontaneous. The truth is, is Jesus does both over and over and over again. Jesus diverts from the plan and he sticks to the plan over and over and over again. It has nothing to do with personality. It has everything to do with calling. It has everything to do with the fact that Jesus had a very clear idea of what he was doing and he didn't want to get off course. And so he was happy to flex in the moment and lay hands and heal. And yet the next morning, it's like, and I'm now going somewhere else. And I got to go. And aren't we glad? Like, aren't we glad that Jesus actually resisted? It's like, he could have stayed and he could have healed and he could have prayed more people. But he's actually like, no, I actually, I have to keep going. If Jesus hadn't done that, if Jesus just been like, okay, I guess there's more need. Here we go. Let's keep going. Then this is what the book of Luke would look like. Okay, we get to chapter five. And then Jesus healed some more sick people and demonized people. And chapter six, and then more sick people came and demons came. And then chapter seven, and then more sick people came. And more, and it was just like chapter 12, chapter 13. It's like, it would never end. But you know what we would miss out on? We would miss out on Jesus calling the religious hypocrites out on their behavior. We would miss out on Jesus challenging the systems and structures of the day. We would miss out on the Sermon on the Mount that is quoted even by atheists. It's like, think of the size of the ship by the wake that it leaves. That's the kind of influence that Jesus was going to have. We would never have the story of the prodigal son. He's just like, oh, more people that are sick. I guess I won't preach that sermon today. You're, You're healed and you're healed. And right, like we would never get the cross, the sacrifice. We would never see the son of God praying forgiveness over the people who are literally nailing him to a cross. We would have missed all that if Jesus just went with the flow and didn't know where he was going. And you just kind of imagine the crowd as Jesus is leaving, like, sorry, I gotta preach somewhere else. Like, but we brought more sick people. And this one has a demon. And this one's blind. Remember your sermon? You're like, you're here for the blind people and the sick people. And it's just like, don't you care about them? There's this guy, Jesus, he cares about them, right? Like, just imagine like the, the kind of tension that would be in that moment. And yet in that moment, Jesus does care, but he moves on. And in that moment, we get a really interesting glimpse into the way that Jesus, and this is gonna bother some of you, but this is kind of how Jesus lived. Just because it's a good thing. You can write this down. This is really good. Just because it's a good thing, and even if it's a God thing, it doesn't mean it's my thing. Just because it's a good thing, and even if it's a God thing, it doesn't mean it's my thing. Jesus does not say to them, friends, your request is invalid. You shouldn't be asking me to heal people. You shouldn't be trying to get at me, right? Like, it's just like, I, I just need to be somewhere else. You know what I love about this? And I'll come back to that one line in a second because some of you are still kind of like bothered by it. That's okay. I love that Jesus took on human limits. Like G- God has no limits. Space and time do not matter to God, but Jesus takes on a body in flesh and blood and he submits himself to the limitations that we have as humans, 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, and he needs some sleep as well. He doesn't just pull out his remote and pause time and like, let me heal all you. And then I get to continue because he's actually showing us what it means to live as a human fully filled with the spirit of God and yet fully within our human limits. And some of you, you're kind of wrestling with that. Can we just go back to that quote again, just for a second? Just because it's a good thing and even if it's a God thing, it doesn't mean it's my thing. And some of you are like, what do you you mean? Like, of course, if it's a Jesus thing and it's a need, then you have to fulfill it. And the reality is, is that tension, actually, there's a lie that you've believed and you've never actually said this. And once I say it, you're gonna be like, okay, that's kind of crazy. But this is the reality is it's, you've actually misunderstood and you think that you're God and not God. But the reality is, is you were born with limitations and you can't actually do it all and you can't actually fight for everything. And when you try and take on everything or you kind of you know, see that and it kind of bothers you, it's like, so you've actually taken God's place. God's like, I actually hold the world together, not you. And so there's this moment where you actually have to pause and realize I have limits just like Jesus. And that's challenging, but it's so important in this moment where we find ourselves because there's so much brokenness on our feeds and Jesus shows us a different way. When Jesus is able to flex his schedule, I love it. He flexes. He's like, no problem. It's gonna be a late night, but let's heal some people and let's get to know them and find out about them, right? He's just like laying hands. I love that visual of like intimacy. Like he just goes close to them. He's like, I can flex my schedule. No problem. I didn't plan for this. And then other times like, but I got somewhere to go. And so the next day, 
He moves on. You know what Jesus doesn't do? He doesn't see these crowds coming in the evening and saying, guys, I have a little bit of time. The problem is, if I heal you tonight, the crowd that finds me tomorrow morning, they're gonna point. If I do it for you, I'm gonna have to do it for them, so I can't do it for you. It's like, no, Jesus does what he can in that moment, and then the next moment when he has other places to be within his human limitations, he goes and does it. Here's how I would summarize what Jesus is doing. Jesus does for one what he wishes he could do for everyone. Jesus does for one what he wishes he could do for everyone. And here's what I would say our battle cry is from today. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. This is something for years we've actually taught in our kids' curriculum, you know, behind that cinder block wall with our children. This is something we're teaching them all the time. We are teaching our children, you have human limitations. You can't do it all. And so from a young age, we want our kids to know, you don't actually have to do it all because you're not God. God is God, you are not, but you are called to love your neighbor. So do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Whether that's one organization, one need, one person, one friend, it's supporting a single mom or a single mom's group, or it's refugees in one specific country. It's a a very specific sector of the community, opiate addiction. You know, it's a friend that you have that's working on the front lines in Thailand and you're like, listen, I I wish I could give to every charity, but I'm actually gonna just put my efforts into giving and praying for them, reaching out to them, sending them letters of encouragement, reaching out to their kids, making sure they're well. Like that's the bandwidth level that I have. It's like, so I'm a do for one what I wish I could do for everyone because the reality is, is you can't do it all and you weren't meant to. So do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And some of you are like, okay, but what's my one? How do I figure that out? And so I've actually created three questions that you're gonna get to go through in your small groups. We'll actually post it online. Now, I'll, I'll get Try and I, don't have time this morning, I'm trying to keep things tight. I'll, try and I'll re- release like a quick YouTube video this week of like three questions to ask yourself as you're trying to figure out what's the do for one that I wish I could do for everyone? What's your do for one? Uh, so we, we kind of have three questions that we kind of use in our family, figuring out where God's calling us in this moment. That's gonna be really helpful, Okay. But as we continue through the passage, some of you are feeling like, like, what difference can I make? And like, if I'm doing for one, like, is that actually gonna change? And what is it? And so we kind of get a case study in the next part of the passage. So let's just jump there and we'll clean it all up at the end, okay? So here's where we go, okay? Verse, chapter five, verse one. Uh, we're gonna jump right into it. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, so this is literally right after he leaves the crowd, okay? So they're like, please stay. And he's like, sorry, I have to go and preach to other, sound, you know, other places as well. And so then he's by the lake, okay? It's like all of a sudden it's like, Jesus is like, I can also preach outdoors. It's like, there's a plug for barn nights. No, that's, that's lame. Um, but it's just like, all of a sudden it's just like, it's like, he's just preaching outside and the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets, okay? Now, when I first read that, right, it's like you have this crowd of people listening to Jesus preaching, and you have these fisher, fishermen who are cleaning their nets. Part of me is like, oh, they're kinesthetic learners. They're like me, right? Like they build Lego or they fold laundry while they're listening because it helps their brain compute. The reality is it's probably not. It's probably they were just bored and they probably didn't care at all. And it's been a long night fishing because the linen nets, that's why they had to clean them. Their linen were used at night because at night the fish couldn't see the nets. And so that's when you fished. You fished at night, not during the day. The fish saw the nets during the day. They've obviously been out fishing all night. They're exhausted. Now there's a preacher on their shore. There's people all around. It's like, please, excuse me, can you not step on my net? I'm just trying, no, can you just hang on? You're gonna, excuse me, right? It's like, it's been a long night. Can you please, right? It's just like, now there's this preacher who's taking up room. And so all of a sudden he got out into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Just imagine you've been fishing all night. Now a preacher shows up on your turf and he's like, hey, can you just take me out a little bit? And he starts to teach them there. And he kind of uses the natural amphitheater. I don't know if you know this, but like water acts like a natural amphitheater. Years ago, we were at a friend's cottage and uh, they had just painted their cottage yellow and they thought it was a wonderful color. And they told us very quickly, they're like, our neighbors don't think so. I'm like, well, how do you know? They're like, because they don't realize that the water's like an amphitheater. And so when they're canoeing by, they're like, ugh, that yellow looks horrible. That's what happens. So Jesus leverages that. He's like, I actually want you guys to hear me. So he gets into the boat. The crowd is so tight. He's like, I just need some space. Backs up a little bit into the boat and he's preaching from there, okay? And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and de- let down your nets for a catch. Now, I just want you to think about this, okay? Long night fishing, cleaning your nets. And now you're like just sitting there with your boat. You just paddled it out a few feet so Jesus could now teach this crowd. And it's like, okay, the sermon's done. Okay, can I go home and take a nap? It's like, let's go fishing. It's like, perfect. The preacher's telling me how to do my job. Excellent, right? And yet, this is what Simon answers. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. 
And that's when you're supposed to fish, by the way, master. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. Something changed, it progressed from, I'm not really interested, I'm just trying to get my nets cleaned and go home. It's been a long day of work that I can't even just sit and take in Jesus to, I'm in the boat, can't be distracted anymore, I'm listening to him. Obviously something in Jesus' message gripped him to the point where he literally, don't miss this, every word matters, he says, master. Literally that was like, you are now the ship's captain, is the way he was responding, like, aye, aye, captain, right? He's like, I wouldn't do this for anybody else but because you say so. Something happened. He caught something in the authority of Jesus' teaching. He's like, I'll do it. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. I want you to just picture this, okay? These, these boats, historians have kind of dug up artifacts and, and archaeology digs. The boats, the fishing boats of that day in this place were about 30 feet long, okay? Pretty much the length of this stage right here. I don't know if you can see, I guess you can't see that online. In the room, you can see that. Think of how many fish it would take to sink two boats. And yet they just finished fishing and the only thing they caught in their nets was moss that they needed to clean out. It's like all of a sudden, it's just like they've experienced something amazing, a miracle, and now their boats are sinking. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his feet and fell at his knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he said, for he, he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Debedee, Simon's partners. It's like, get away from me. To which if I'm Jesus, I'd be like, oh, where would you like me to go? We're in the middle of a lake with fish and we're sinking. It's like, it's like, well, just walk on water. It's like, I haven't done that yet. You don't know I can do that, right? It's just like, where am I gonna go? The interesting thing is, think about this. The crowds wanted to get closer to Jesus. And yet Simon in this moment is like, I, I can't even be in your presence. He's like, he just realized he is in the presence of holiness, of a God who could fill a boat when he just spent all night fishing and couldn't catch one. And he's standing in this. He's like, I'm a sinner. I, I don't, I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. I shouldn't be here. I should have never gotten the boat. Like, I, this is awe and overwhelmed, right? He's just like, I need to get away. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't tell him, you're right. I'm glad you figured it out. Let's paddle the shore and you can get away from me. Jesus moves closer. And he actually invites him into relationship. In fact, what we're gonna see in a second, into an internship. It's like, all of a sudden, Simon Peter's like, I'm a sinner, I shouldn't be here. And Jesus is like, I'm, I'm not even worried about that. I'd like to move closer and start a relationship with you. Yeah, but I, I just, I, you just, and I can't, it's just like, wanna come follow me? Wanna be with me for the next three years? This is exactly what God is like. As Robin was talking about last week, we see holiness as this thing that we need to run from, but holiness is actually what brings us freedom, wholeness and freedom for individuals and communities. This is the posture of God towards people. He moves closer towards us in our brokenness, in our shame, in our embarrassment. And then Jesus says something really interesting. He said, don't be afraid, Simon. From now on, you'll fish for people. What? I feel like that wasn't the natural progression of where this story was going, right? It's just like, whoa, and then it's just like, don't worry, don't worry, now we're gonna fish for people. It's like, that feels kind of weird. Maybe we missed something in 2,000 years of history. Like, what does that mean? And people have kind of played with the words and all that stuff and try to mean, but it's actually very simple. You see, the words are different, right? We kind of read that and we think like, okay, I used to fish for fish, now I'm fishing for people. Like, what in the world does that mean? But the words are actually different, that the word that says, you know, catching fish in, in the original language was actually when he's pulling these nets, in the, the nets and getting all these fish into the boat to the point where it's sinking, the word was actually seclusion. I did not pronounce that right, I promise you, okay? But seclusion, which, which was to shut up or to make prisoner. That was the word to describe what they did with the fish. They caught them, they're prisoners, now they're gonna kill them, put them, not on ice, didn't have ice back then, they're gonna put them to market and sell them, okay? Shut them up, make them prisoner. So then when Jesus says, and now you're gonna catch people, it's like, you're thinking, shut up and make them prisoners too. Some of you are like, that sounds like religion, right? It's like, but here's the thing that we miss sometimes in translation. The word that Jesus uses to catch people is not seclusion, it's zagreo, which means to catch alive. 
which is a totally different meaning. Instead of grabbing people, shutting them up, killing them, putting them to market for a profit, in a sense, using people, what Jesus was communicating was, hey, you used to fish for people and kill them and put them to market, but now you're gonna catch people. You're gonna take them from captivity. You're gonna take them alive. Literal and metaphorical captivity. You're gonna help free people from sin and slavery and demonic oppression and social injustice. You're gonna join me in setting them free. The bottom line Jesus is saying is, let's help people find freedom. He's like, I see you guys are pretty good at fishing. Not great. Clearly the preacher can fish better than you. How about a career change? How about we help people? Let's introduce people to the kingdom of God where they can find personal and communal wholeness. That's what we're all about here at Lakeside. When we're inviting people to discover and fully follow Jesus, we're not inviting people to checklists, to rules. There are things we invite people to do and not do in Jesus' name, but we're inviting them to the bigger picture. The 30,000 foot view is wholeness and freedom for communities and individuals. And this, in this boat with fish everywhere, it's like, where do I even stand? It's like, do you want to come? Do you want to leave us behind and come and help me help, help others find freedom? And what did they do? So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. If I was Jesus, I'd be like, you guys sure you don't want to clean your nets for a few minutes first? Like, you, you just want to leave all that? The height of their careers, they left everything. Let's summarize where we've been so far. Number one, just because a good thing, and even if it's a God thing, it doesn't mean it's my thing. Now, let me be clear what I mean by this. It doesn't mean we don't care about all the things that I've listed and all the injustice. Those are all things that are dear to our heart. It just means that we realize we have human limits and that we are not God and we don't hold the world together and we're not responsible for all of it. We are responsible to be who God has called us to be. And in this moment, Simon's been called out of his boat, doesn't know where he's going. He's like, but I can do that. I can leave my business behind. I can follow you, Jesus. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. That's what Jesus shows us. And then we trust God with the rest. This is my favorite, favorite part of the Christian faith, is actually the idea that we can't and shouldn't try to do it all. Because Jesus actually describes the church as a body. He says we're all different parts. And if you try and be him and she tries to be her, it's like we're gonna be in trouble. But if we would all just do the one or two or few things that God puts us before us in any given moment, and accept our human limitations. Imagine, imagine what would happen. We wouldn't be checking out because we're overwhelmed and I can't do that. And if I can't do it for them, I shouldn't do it for them. It's just like, okay, God, what's today or what's this year? What's this decade or what's this season with young children? What's the thing or things, the few things you want me to focus on that I can give all my attention, all my horsepower, all my energy? You know why that excites me? Because when I think five, 10 years down the road and I think about this beautiful community called Lakeside Church, I want that for us. I so don't want us to just kind of have filled in like a cog in a wheel, just like the pastor said we're doing this, so now we're passionate about this. And then they did this campaign. Like we're gonna do stuff. Like we're talking about like what things as a church can we put our horsepower behind? And we will do that. But you need to know that more important to me is that every single person that is part of this Jesus community knows how to hear God and follow him in their lives. That I just imagine if every single one of us was doing this every day, just saying, Lord, I can't do it all, but what do you want me to focus on? What's my one that I wish I could do for everyone? And if we all put our energy in those different places, getting together would be so fun. You know, sitting at a table, chatting with other like siders, and what, what are you passionate about? It's like, I, I, I just, it's, got this amazing opportunity years ago and I've just been focused on it. I've been putting all my horsepower. I actually dropped a few hours at work a week or I passed on a promotion so I could just invest in this one thing. Tell me about what you're involved in. 
Honestly, I just felt like in this season, I was supposed to invest in my kids. That was my one. I wish I could do more, but it's just been a crazy season. Or I'm just, I'm investing in my marriage. Or I'm caring for an elderly parent. There's something amazing that happens when we accept our limitations and just give everything that we have to what God is giving us and trust God with the rest. You know what we're left with when we do that? We don't have this uniform cookie cutter faith community. We have a mosaic. We have this quilted blanket of all these beautiful things that God's doing, all these different stories. And the theme is the spirit of unity is speaking to every one of us and we're following that voice. What would it look like if we understood this idea that we are limited and so we do for one what we wish we could do for everyone? Can you stand? I wanna bless you if you're in the room today. Just wanna remind you before I bless you that our prayer teams are gonna be up at the front. They're gonna be by the crosses. You feel free to come on up for prayer. Um, other team members, Trefina, our host, will be out, out uh, by the parking lot. Love to connect with you there. Just feel free to hang around. Let your kids play on the grass, whatever. Um, but as you go, can I just bless you with these words? God is God. And God will hold the world together. And you are free to love your neighbor. That you don't have to worry about everything, but you can worry about something. Go in Jesus' name. We'll see you next week, friends.